All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this We are Northampton Neighbors and we're presenting the speaker series. The first thing I'd request is, would you, everyone mute yourselves? Northampton Neighbors, you everyone may know about this, but we have over 950 members and we're, our goal is helping seniors uh, stay, stay and age in place. Um, we're unique in that we have no fees for joining and, and no fees for services. We're thinking about shortly rejoining, being able to give direct services to all of the people who are over 55 who request them. We've had a bit of a pause during COVID for obvious reasons. Um, I want to acknowledge that two of our committee members, I'm part of Northampton Neighbors and I'm part of the Speakers Committee. I'm Sarah Backrack and Naomi Gerstel is here, who's our fearless leader of the Speakers Committee and Mark Carpell, who's our leader and does some great presentations. So look them up on the uh, Northampton Neighbor YouTube. Um, the logistics are we have Nina Kleinberg here, who's the computer person and she will be recording this meeting. She does exquisite work. If you don't want to be recorded when you want to ask a question, if we can ask it in person later on, uh, just turn off your camera and you can ask the question. But otherwise we are recording. Um, we generally request that you put all your questions in the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Just click on chat write your question and then click on enter so that it will be seen. Um, and we also have a great service called Otter. It's in the upper left-hand corner and it's for transcription. So if you wanna read it as, it, as it's happening, uh, just click on Otter. If you wanna, uh, if you see subtitles across the bottom and, and they're annoying to you, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen and just click hide subtitles. Um, let me see. Uh, the talk is being recorded. You can find it on NorthamptonNeighbors.org uh, YouTube channel, and you can also find it on Open Media. And all of our talks, as people probably heard Mark say, a lot of people check in and, and look at the talks later if they can't make it today. This is also our last talk for the season. We've been going since last May, um, every other week, and it's been wonderful, and the talks have been great. Um, and we will take a summer break and everyone hopefully will be able to enjoy the summer this year, but we'll see you on October 8th when John Feynman is going to do a talk on stopping mass incarceration with humanity and weightlifting. And that should be, uh, I'm very curious and I think that's going to be a really exciting talk. So let me introduce Jennifer, Jennifer Restucci is very kind to give up the talk for us. She grew up in the Pioneer Valley, went to college in New Hampshire, but she's worked in Georgia, Vermont and Massachusetts, but she had to come home and that's good. She's worked in ICUs with um, ICU patients after their strokes with spinal cord injuries, multiple orthopedic injuries, and she's been an OT for over 23 years. The last nine and a half years, she's been at Cooley Dickinson VNA in the hospice and she'll let us know how to stay safe and continue to live in our homes. So thank you, Jennifer, for speaking and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Allow me a second to share my screen with you. So one of the most important things when we think about being home is entering our home. So um, I like to always start by first of all, explaining everybody's goal is to stay home. And heaven forbid, most of the people I work with in home care have had illnesses or injuries that have caused them to go to a nursing home or, or hospital first and then a nursing home or to a rehab. And most people in their minds have this image of, I'm gonna go home and it's gonna be exactly the same as I was before I left. We call that the magic door syndrome. Um, so in home care, people are already home. And so I get the fortunate opportunity to work with them and help them figure out, okay, now that they're home, how do they stay safe? Now, these, the people that are listening to the talk today or listening in the future, um, hopefully have not had that same process of hospital or rehab stay before coming home. And we're just looking at how to keep you safe in your sweet home right now. So entering the house, there's lots of options that are available. Um, 
in home care, I enter all kinds of houses and all kinds of neighborhoods. And um, the stairs are the biggest challenge and the thresholds and the doorways. And so here's a picture of an easy modification. One of my favorite adaptations to a screen door. A lot of people say I can get in the house, but I can't manage the screen door and the indoor door myself. There's a pneumatic device that um, rather than that, um, door opener that has a little slide thing that's either up top and I'm too short to reach or at the bottom where you have to go down and try to reach it. Um, it's a push button system. And so that is what's on this door in the, in the picture. It's a push button system. So the door is staying open itself. You see me holding onto a grab bar and it's pretty unobtrusive. Uh, and there's an extra step that they've created that's portable because that initial step sometimes in a lot of these older homes in our Pioneer Valley can be a doozy. So grab bars are usually the place that I start. And when people think grab bars, they think the big silver things that you see in handicapped bathrooms around. But grab bars are anything that can securely be attached to a, a surface, to a wall, to a door casing that um, gives enough circumference for your hand to be able to go around. So bathrooms tend to be the place where most grab bars are. Uh, what I appreciate is our uh, society has finally caught up to grab bars being trendy. So these are actually grab bar fixtures that look like and function like regular um, household features. So there's a towel bar, but it's actually secure and is a grab bar. So those kinds of modifications, a lot of people will use their towel bar getting in and out of the shower. People tend to have one right there. That is the worst thing to hang on to. So I encourage people to take out those towel bars and have a grab bar installed replacing your uh, toilet paper holder with a grab bar. So if you see in that picture there, what's holding the toilet paper is also a grab bar right there. So I like when it can look sleek. Um, not that looks are always that important, but people you know, are very prideful and they don't want to acknowledge that they might need a little bit of a boost getting up sometimes. And so here again, when we're talking about grab bars and we're talking about the shower, what I look at are ways to safely step in and step out. Um, so here again, having an option that is both safe and functional, that inside grab bar also functions as a, a holder for shampoo and body wash, and all the essentials. I always recommend two grab bars, one on the outside, preferably along the wall where you're going to step in vertically so that you can hang on and one horizontally on the inside to hang on to because when your shower door closes or your shower curtain closes, you want to be able to hold on to something sturdy and the one outside the shower is not conducive to being held to when the door or the curtain are shut. Um, when you go to shampoo your hair or you reach down and wash your legs, having something to hang on to is important. Bed rails are another option. So here's just a grab bar to help you get out of bed. When people hear the word grab bars, they think to themselves these long bars that are designed to keep you in your bed. That is absolutely not what these are designed for. Um, the, I, the picture on the left-hand side with it attached to the bed, that grab bar is in a very bad position. I would move it about two feet up towards those pillows. So it's right in line with the pillows so that when you roll over, you're able to hold on to that bar and push yourself up or you can even use it to help yourself roll over if you're having difficulty with that. A lot of people I encounter have back pain or hip or leg pain. And so trying to move their lower bodies and move their upper bodies at the same time can be a challenge. Um, we call it log rolling when you roll yourself completely over and that's where this bed rail can come in very handy. Uh, oftentimes people's mattresses are very soft. So trying to grab onto the side of the mattress to pull yourself up or push your, you know, move yourself around isn't as easy. Whereas this uh, grab bar makes it much more convenient. It just slides between a mattress and a box spring. I actually just helped a family put one of these together this afternoon. Uh, it's about a 10 minute setup, no tools required. I like this specific one because it is height adjustable. So everybody's bed frame is a different height. Everybody's mattress is a different height. Uh, this one is very user friendly uh, because it can accommodate so many different styles of beds. This one works very well with those new Tempur-Pedic beds that are adjustable. So not the hospital beds, but the, the beds that have the head and foot adjustability because the system goes between, like I said, the mattress and box spring, the grab bar just moves as the bed moves. And grab bars come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. This one 
has the two feet that sit on the floor. This one's a little bit wider. It's not height adjustable, so it's a little bit more low profile. So if you if you feel like you're reaching too high for the rounded version, this one is a little bit wider. It can also serve to help kind of secure people in bed a little bit. We, I, like I said, we don't encourage you to use it as a, um, a restraint or some way to keep somebody in the bed um, because it's not that tall. And so for some people's mattresses, their mattress is so tall that it's in line with the top of the grab bar. So this wouldn't be the best choice if your mattress is of the thicker variety. Sometimes those legs on the ground are an issue, however. And so this is a third option that again is not height adjustable, but this one completely fits underneath between the mattress and the box spring. And so there's nothing for somebody's foot to get caught on, nothing for a wheelchair wheel or a walker leg to get stuck on. So it really depends on the person and the situation. These um, are all available online. Uh, from various retailers. There's, I know that Northampton has hometown medical supply. Um, there's lots of different vendors in our area, um, Lewis and Clark and Mass Surgical Supply, Agawam Medical, lots of places will have them. I always encourage people to find a picture or get the name of something and go online for anything that I'm talking about. Because when you go to a medical supply store, you're going to pay medical supply prices. Um, and oftentimes you can find it a little less expensive if you do a little research from even an online medical supply company might be a little less expensive. In our area, one of the things that I found is there are so many homes that have what I considered a standard height toilet. So if your house is one of these, it feels like you're sitting so low on the ground that your knees are up in the air a little bit. And it makes it very difficult. And it's a lot of effort that is required to transition sit to stand from a toilet seat. We've all been conditioned over time to use our arms whenever we can. We sit in a captain's chair at the dinner table and we push ourselves up. You know, we sit on the couch and we put our hands down to get up from the seat. There is no really secure place on most toilets to hang on to, nor do we really wanna hold on to the edge of the toilet seat to get up. So these bars, there's two different versions here in this picture, give you the option. So going to the picture on the left-hand side where you see that is a raised toilet seat. When people hear raised toilet seat, they think the big old plastic ones that sit on the toilet and usually they clamp on or they get attached on some way. They're not comfortable. If you've ever sat on one, they are completely not comfortable to sit on. And the challenge with how those are made is they made the toilet seat about three to four inches taller However, they've made the bowl opening smaller. So from that perspective, a lot of my male patients have a very hard time using a raised toilet seat because not all parts go in where they're supposed to go. So this is my favorite type of a raised toilet seat. It can be used on both a round bowl and it also comes in an elongated version. So if you have more of an oval shaped toilet, they make it for that as well. Um, so it's called elongated. And so it goes between your bowl and your toilet seat. That way you're getting the extra three and a half inch height. You're getting the bars. Now, if you decide you don't want the bars, the bars are removable. Um, but then you get to sit on your own toilet seat, which really just feels that much more comfortable for all of us to not sit on something hard and plastic. If your toilet seat is what they now consider comfort height, it used to be called handicapped height, but now that we all love it, it's called comfort height, which what most toilets that you buy now are. Um, then on the right-hand side, you see a picture that are just what they call toilet safety rails. We don't wanna make your toilet any taller because on a comfort height toilet, which is usually about 18 to 19 inches, if we make it taller, we're talking 22 inches, our feet, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. So I don't need the height, I just need the bars. These are my favorite set of uh, bars for the toilet because all four components, all four pieces of this toilet safety rails attach to the toilet itself. So there's no trip hazard. You see there's nothing around the base of the toilet that people's feet or their walker or their wheelchair um, could, get could cause a tripping hazard. Staying in the bathroom. Showering, being able to bathe yourself is something that's huge. Most people, you know, will say, well, Jen, you know what? I 
get in the shower and I hold onto the wall or I hold onto that soap dish, you know, I hold onto the little bar where the washcloth is. So that is not a grab bar. That little washcloth holder is meant to hold just that amount of weight, uh, just the weight of a wet washcloth. It barely goes into your shower enclosure uh, less than like an eighth of an inch on either side. So any kind of weight or pressure can cause that to fall. Um, so I always encourage people to consider having a seat. If you have back pain, if you have leg pain, if you just fatigue very easy, if you're somebody who's on oxygen and you get tired and just want to rest, having a seat in the shower, even if you don't use it all the time, it gives you the option to stay safe and enjoy a shower. A lot of people that I work with are afraid to take a shower because they're afraid to slip and fall or they're afraid of the amount of effort that it takes to be able to shower. And so these are some shower options um, that we'll go through, some of my favorites. So a tub bench. So the key, the big key with this one is two feet of this bench sit outside the tub, two feet sit inside. The backrest can be adjusted as you see in the pictures to go either direction. The handle is always on the inside. This lets a person safely sit on the outside of the tub, swing their feet in and just scoot themselves across. Uh, that way you're, you'd get rid of the need to manage that step up and over the tub wall. Because for some people, that tub wall can be a good 18 to 24 inches, especially with some of the old soaker tubs that I've seen, um, which is really treacherous. That's usually the biggest concern people have is stepping over the tub. They just can't quite get their leg up high enough this tub bench gives people that option. Again, the big question I get is, Jen, how do I keep the water from getting all over the floor? So if you are the type of person who has a shower liner on the inside and a shower curtain, or if you just have the shower curtain, doesn't make a difference either way. What I tell people to do is to sit on the tub bench and take that shower curtain, you pull it across either from the front to the back or the back to the front, either way, and tuck it under your hip a little bit. And that's going to help the water funnel right back into the shower and knock it all over the floor. I also encourage people to put a towel right along where you see that person's foot in the picture. Uh, put a beach towel or something right there along the floor as a water catcher. Uh, and that kind of helps stop any drips that might happen. But for people who don't feel like they need something that is that cumbersome. Um, okay, let me back up. So um, this is an option, handheld showers or something that we encourage, uh, just because, especially if you're using either the, I'm going to go back a couple of slides. If you're using the shower chair, you'll notice that all four feet of this would sit inside the shower. Again, it's height adjustable. You've got armrest to hang on to, to safely transition, sit to stand. Um, or if you're sitting down on the tub bench, you're going to want a handheld shower. Now, the handheld shower attaches at the top where the faucet is, but if the whole point is sitting down for safety, you don't want to stand up to get the shower head down. These are options, add-on options that you buy separately. The one on the left is actually securely mounted into the shower, screwed into the wall. The one on the right is a suction cup version. So you can literally get that handheld shower anywhere within your reach that's going to feel comfortable. Um, it's nice to be able to then adjust the water. Sometimes people will just let their shower head hang as they're showering, but then depending on the force of the water where you live, that handheld shower can look like it's alive because the water makes it push against the shower wall or against the shower curtain. And then that's where you end up flooding the bathroom. So this is a, a really safe and easy option to adjust and manage that handheld shower option. Safety first, right? The slipping in the shower is what people tell me is their biggest concern. If your tub has no texture on the bottom, right? Some of the shower enclosures that are kind of a one a fabricated thing have a texture. These are bathroom safety strips, which you could buy in a package. Of, I want to say a package of 20 and they're about $5 at the local box stores. Uh, and they just adhesive on the back and you just put them where you're gonna stand. If you're gonna use one of the benches or the shower chair from the previous screens, you put them right, you see where that picture is on the left-hand side, right in front of the drain, so that if you do wanna stand to rinse or stand to do whatever you need to do, you know, wash private parts, you have something right up under you. The, and so I also have people use these in front of the toilet. If you have linoleum or if you have tile, 
Um, I'm not a big fan of rugs in front of the toilet because they become a safety hazard with either a walker or a cane or a wheelchair, it gets bumpy. But I do like putting down these strips for traction. Um, if this is not an option for you because you have a textured bottom of your tub, my next option is one of the, what I call the old time rubber mats with the suction cups on the back. So you wanna make sure that it's um, the kind that do have the suction cups and not a mat that just lays in the bottom because the, if there's no suction cups on the back, there's gonna be nothing that's gonna help it adhere to the bottom of your tub. Um, you always wanna put it in when your tub is dry so that you can get as much of a uh, suction as possible. If you are using a, a tub bench or a shower chair, I encourage people to put the mat down and then put two of the, either the front legs of the chair or at least one leg of the tub bench on the rug to help keep it secure. Being dressed is another area that a lot of my patients find effortful and challenging. And um, so I have a couple of strategies for managing keeping your independence. So on the left is a reacher. It's called a grabber. It's called a picker upper, whatever you'd like to call it. It comes in a lot of different lengths um, and a lot of different configurations. Uh, this one looks to me about a 32 inch, so just under three feet, which sounds like it's a wonderful length. Unless you are six feet tall, this one is going to be too long for you. 24 inches is really a great dimension um, because you're going to be using it. It's on a trigger system, so you're going to pull the trigger and this end, the teeth are going to close. So if you think about it, two feet, if you're holding it, you pull the trigger, you bring it up to you, you don't want to have to reach out three feet to pick up something. You want it to be pretty close to you. So a shorter one is a better option. Now you can buy them where instead of being a vertical orientation, it is a horizontal orientation for squeezing. It doesn't really make a difference. That's a preference for, for people. They also make them now with suction cups in um, the horizontal orientation, which is great if you can't reach a glass or if you can't reach a soup can. I wouldn't pick up anything heavier than a soup can though, because that's a lot of weight at the end of a stick. Um, but it is a great option for reaching your feet to pick up something if you dropped. It'll pick up a pen. It will pick, it sometimes will pick up a pill depending on the side of the pill, size of the pill. I actually have put a piece of tape on the end and taught patients how to use tape to pick up their pills that they drop um, without having to bend to the floor. You just put a piece of tape at the end and, and use it as a little grabber that way. The, there's multi uses. I encourage people to have these in every room of their house, those reachers. Um, it's great for getting laundry out of the bottom of the washer. It's great for getting the clothes out of the back of the dryer. Um, any, there's so many multi-purpose uses in the bathroom. I teach people to be able to start their pants and their underwear over their feet by using, uh, by going fishing for their own feet using their reacher. The picture on the right-hand side is called a foot funnel. This is something that one of my colleagues shared with me about seven years ago. And it is one of my favorite gadgets. I am not coordinated enough to use a long handled shoehorn to put shoes on. I can't quite figure out which direction the shoehorn has to go, which direction my foot and heel have to go. And a lot of my, the people that I work with, their mobility is not good enough to be able to rotate their foot one direction or the other. So this is uh, an option that just goes around the back part of a shoe. It just sits there. It's like the letter C and you can see that there's strings attached. You attach it to the shoe, lower the shoe to the floor, put your foot right in the shoe and, and push your foot down. That device stays in place. Once your foot is in the shoe, you pull the string. You can pick up the string with the reacher if you have one, so you don't have to bend over for that and pull, you pop that shoehorn right out of the, the foot funnel, right out of the back of the shoe. And you don't worry about the back of that shoe caving in on you. And then you have to kind of dig it out, which is the hardest part with a lot of pairs of uh, sneakers or soft backed shoes. It works with some slippers as well, depending on the firmness of the slippers themselves. Socks, your feet have never felt so far away if you have back pain or knee pain or anything that limits your lower mobility to be able to either cross a leg to bring your foot closer to you or to reach your feet to be able to get socks started. This is called a sock aid. Um, now the thing with this is it's either a love-hate relationship. So my patients either, either love it or they hate it. There's no way in between. 
but once you learn to use it, I think it's an incredible option. They come in two different styles. The one on the left is what they call a molded sock aid. And unfortunately, the manufacturers do not send the sock aid attached with that blue piece of foam on the back. It comes separately in the package. People don't know what it's used for, so they throw it away. Without that little piece of foam, that sock aid is useless. So the heel of your sock drags right over that little blue piece of foam, and that's what helps pull your sock up onto your foot. It helps create that drag. Without that drag, there is no way that sock's going on your foot. The picture on the right-hand side shows the sock already on the age, on the, on the sock aid, and the, the person is pulling the sock over their foot. This one is considered a flexible sock aid. So it, it's, it looks like three prongs, so it's moldable. This one I recommend for people who have swelling in their feet because it is flexible and you can, uh, it does accommodate for the fact that if your feet are more swollen one day versus the other, it's easier to get those socks started. Compression stockings. So if you've ever worn compression stockings, you know that they're a bear to put on. And if you've ever put on compression stockings on somebody else, it's like trying to put on a pair of pantyhose for somebody else. Um, they are really tough and it's a labor of love to put them on and take them off. One of the best suggestions that I've come across is um, going to the dollar store and buying a pair of yellow rubber kitchen gloves. That helps a lot of my patients with arthritis who have a hard time trying to pull that extra that tight material up their legs this way um the you can actually use the palms of your hands and you can actually use that the rubber kitchen gloves to be able to get socks started on those sock aids from the previous slide as well the uh rubber kitchen gloves just give you a traction that you need that sometimes depending on what your dexterity is like depending on what your finger strength is like it gets harder for us to be able to do this image on the right is called the easy slide. And in the next picture, I have a video, a little video to show you on how it's used. So this is designed, this actually, it looks like a, it's made out of what feels like parachute material. It's slippery. And you put that over your foot. This one is designed for compression stockings that have open toes at the end. They do make one for closed toed as well. Let me show you little video. You can see that she's got gloves on and she just put that right over her foot. Slide that sock. If you've ever tried to do that, getting the stocking over the heel is the hardest part of the job. And then once it's on, hold one side, keep it in place, and then pull that little gadget right out through the toes, and the stocking takes in place. Now, what I've learned is there's a something called the easy off, which was a pretty ingenious trick as well. I never thought about that. Because a lot of my patients will say, I can get my stockings on, I just can't get them off. So she wraps it around. And again, it's that same kind of material. She folds it over and starts pulling the stocking down. Flies over itself easier. And like I said, that also comes in a an option of closed toed versus open toed. Okay, so home improvements, right? We've talked about a lot about gadgets, a lot about things for taking care of yourself, getting washed up. People will say, well, how do I know that my house is safe? What kinds of, what kinds of things should I be looking for? And that's through the VNA, that's one of the things that 
I, as an occupational therapist, go out and do, I do what we call a home safety assessment. Um, but a lot, nobody in your group really qualifies for home care services. So the suggestion I have is to ask a family member or a friend who doesn't live with you to walk through your house with you. A fresh set of eyes is super helpful to help identify tripping hazards. You know, one of the big things that we always look for is, are there area rugs or throw rugs that are around? Or you know to step on a certain corner or you know to lift your foot because that section curls up a little bit. Um, or is there a, a, do you have a rug where you have a wire running underneath? So just having somebody else with a fresh set of eyes and a, a different perspective look at things is super helpful. If you are willing to remove area rugs and throw rugs, I already talked to you and said that I'm not crazy about rugs in the bathroom. Um, it's okay to put a rug down if and when you're going to shower. So you have something preferably with a rubber back uh, right outside the shower so that as you step out, there's something solid and uh, safe for you to step on. But if you're willing to remove other rugs, it's the preference. If not, we ask you to please consider using double-sided tape to stick them to the floor. Um, two handrails on all sets of stairs is also the recommendation and lighting. You know, that's the biggest thing, tripping at night. Um, I bet you we can all say how many steps it is from the edge of our bed to the toilet without turning the lights on in our own house. We know, we know what that negotiation pathway is. Um, but having the way lighted is the preference and is the safety recommendation. So night lights in the hallway um, or a motion sensor that will turn on a light uh, as you enter a room uh, is also a great choice. So talking about lighting, there's such a thing as lighted outlet switches. So, you know, you don't want to be fumbling for where the light switch is in the middle of the night. Or if you don't want the whole hallway lit up and you just want a little bit of a, a light, but you don't have a, a plug to put in a night light, these lighted outlet switches will light a hallway, which is kind of a nice option. It will light the floor underneath where it is. And then there's also night lights on the right-hand side picture that are motion censored. I am a big fan of these. I have them throughout my house. I like the fact that when it gets dusk, the lights will come on. I don't have to worry about remembering to go turn the night lights off in each room uh, the next morning. Uh, the sensor just does all of that for me. Stairwell lighting at the top and the bottom is key. Um, so if you have, um, most of us have a light either at the top or the bottom, but the rest of the stairs are a, a little dark. So again, the motion sensor lights that light up every couple steps are a good choice. And again, here's a picture of a railing on both sides of the stairs. Other life hacks that I've just come up with through the years as an OT, um, I am so afraid for people carrying a laundry basket down the stairs. I've had people tell me, well, I go down the stairs backwards and I drag the laundry basket uh, with me and we take, go one stair at a time. Or people will tell me, I put my clothes in the laundry, in a laundry bag, and I throw the plastic bag down the stairs. And so in my head, what I've seen is, um, or what I've experienced is treating people who have had issues where their laundry bag breaks and, you know, a pair of underwear or a sock is in the stairs and they try to go around it and they lose their balance. So they slip on it because they don't see it and have falls down the stairs. So one of my favorite gadgets to use for a load of laundry are those reusable grocery bags that we all have. Um, Big Y, Whole Foods, Stop and Shop, um, the co-op, any of those places, that bag with the two shoulder handles is a load of laundry if you fill it up. So that way you can put the bag over your shoulder, have both hands to go up and down the stairs safely and still be able to manage your laundry. Um, with everybody, most people now having cell phones, you know, managing medications has always been a big challenge for people too. Um, if you don't take them at the same time, or if you're, if you're good in the morning and good at bedtime, but you miss the two o'clock dose, setting alarms on your phone to serve as that reminder is uh, a great option for a lot of people. And it just helps them stay independent and compliant. Being that the the world is opening up finally, thanks that to COVID getting better under control, trying to get out of the house and enjoy the beautiful weather like today is really important. Um, a lot of people have trouble getting out of the car. So this is a great little gadget that uh, works on either 
um, the passenger side or on the driver's side. So what happens is you open your car door and that little silver piece on the end, this is called a car cane. It just sits in the little uh, cutout that where the door, your door latches. It serves as a grab bar. You know, most of us have the oh crap handles in, in our car that we can use to pull up from. The challenge with those is when you go to get out of a vehicle, those are behind you. You know, and if you try to push on the back of the, the seat, again, if you're trying to push from behind you to get leverage to go forward. So this car cane is uh, in the front in regards to in front of you, which makes it then easier. Um, and it can be used in anybody's car. You can stick it in a purse, you can stick it in a coat pocket, and it's very interchangeable. So this is what we all would hope to aspire to of staying strong and staying healthy. Um, so I would like to open it up to any questions. I know that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. Like I said, I've been an OT for 23 years. So this is my passion, all of these kinds of gadgets and things. So please let me know um, what questions that you have. I mean, I'll jump in here as well. And I, I did forget to tell people that speaker view is often a good, uh, good view to have, and you can get speaker view in the upper left, upper right hand corner. Um, please put your questions in chat because we do have 36 people, so we can't see you on one screen. So far in chat, we have a Reacher is great and affordable. I used it last week to pick up a bottle of sunscreen that fell behind the washing machine. Absolutely. Like I said, one in every room. Another question is you didn't talk about the, uh, the stair escalator. The oh, the stair chair. chair. The stair chair. Um, could you just talk about that a little bit? And are there any situations or diagnoses that Medicare would pay for the stair chair? Okay, so a stair chair is a system that gets installed. What I know about the companies that some of my patients have used, um, you can rent them for a fee or you can buy them outright. Um, the prices vary depending on the orientation of your stairs, depending on how many stairs you're going up, depending on the landings, where you have landings. Um, I'm currently working with a woman who lives in a three-story condo. So she literally has a stair chair that goes up all three levels and she can stop on each landing. Um, they're expensive, but they let people stay in their home because they give you the access to negotiating the stairs up and down. In regards to what diagnoses, I'm not sure that Medicare covers the stair chairs at all. Medicare covers a walker or a wheelchair and a hospital bed for certain diagnoses every five years. So if you have a walker, I will get back to answer the stair chair question in a minute, but while I'm on this tangent, mm -hmm. um, if you get a walker and then you know two years later you need a wheelchair, Medicare will not cover that because they bought you the walker you know, two years prior. Um, so it's always worth, if you have private insurance, it's always worth asking the question of if the insurance company will cover any part of it. Um, but diagnoses, anybody who has um, balance issues, Parkinson's disease, people who have, um, I have a patient with ALS who uses the stair chair. I have a patient with severe arthritis who can't put weight on her left hip. She's the one who has the spiral um, staircase, the spiral stair chair up her, up her, both sets of stairs for her. Um, people who have an amputation and who cannot negotiate the stairs anymore because of um, have not using a prosthesis, that's a good option. Uh, I have a gentleman who used a stair chair after a stroke. Um, so it, there's a wide variety of diagnoses that it would work for. There is something and I'm, the name is going to escape me right now, and I apologize, but Mass Rehab, oh goodness, there's an organization where you can, it's like kind of like a reverse home equity, where you can um, borrow money from the state to make home improvements, and that loan is um, not taxable, and it does not get paid back until after you sell your house. Um, and I cannot come up with the name of that right now. I apologize, but I can get you the information so that you can share it with the group later on. I apologize that the name is not coming to me at the moment. Um, I had done this talk for Amherst Neighbors back in February, and one of the participants there had actually used that program, and she loved it. She had nothing but high praise to say for how easy it was to use um, and what a great resource that was. 
Uh, someone just asked, do a st does the steer chair have the capacity to turn a corner if you don't have an actual landing, you just have a curve? It does. It does. So the minute you start to add corners, that's where the price gets very extensive. Um, and so I can't say for certain. I had a family friend who just had a, a, a straight stair chair put in because the woman had a brain tumor and it was $16,000 for a stair chair to go up a flight of stairs. Um, and they had a landing at the top and a landing at the bottom. Um, so when you start adding curves, it gets much more expensive. Uh, there's a question. I live in an apartment building. What's a way to get management to put railings on both sides of the stairs? Ah, excellent. Um, ask for, first of all, asking, sometimes you can just saying, you know what, I went to a talk today and they talked about the importance of putting up two railings. Would you be willing? So sometimes even just starting there. You can also go through your primary care doctor or if you if you have an issue with mobility or um, a concern for falls, um, asking your doctor to write a letter. Um, they have medical assistants in the doctor's office who are more than willing to do things like that. That um, will then, that, that might be enough. Okay, there's a, another comment uh, from Larry Picard. His husband wears Kizix shoes, K-I-Z-I-K, -I -I that have a special heel that allows you to step into your shoes without a shoehorn. Oh, and he I love them. it. So I'll look those up. <laughs> uh, Larry put the website in chat so you can, everyone can look that up if you'd like. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Are there community programs that'll help you get grab bars or a stair rail? The stair railing or like an uh, extra railing on the, to go up a set of stairs. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I think that that where we recommend is going to groups like yours to do yeah. that, to ask for that, because there are, there is no community organization. There's um, Medicare doesn't even cover grab bars. They do not consider them medically necessary. Um, they consider them a luxury item. So same thing, Medicare will not cover a tub bench. Medicare will not cover a shower chair. Medicare will cover a, a bedside commode, which is something I didn't show in the pictures, um, but it's a, a commode that you could put by your bed. They will only cover that if you cannot access your own bathroom. So um, you could try putting it out to um, local civic organizations. Yeah, I saw the chat of the luxury item Medicare is nuts. Yes, I would love to have the CEO of Medicare as my patient on a fixed income. Like they, they have no idea what, you know, the fact that taking a shower and feeling safe and being able to wash yourself and wash your hair and have that dignity, how that's considered a luxury item, I don't understand. Um, but try civic organizations. Sometimes you can find groups like the Elks or the Lions that might be willing. I think the issue now, unfortunately, in our society is liability. Um, a lot of organizations are not willing to install grab bars or railings out of the liability issue. There are, usually we have people go through contractors because we can't even recommend anybody to you because it's a liability issue on our side as well. Um, but I have people start with, you know, aging in place or um, different local contractors. It's harder because a lot of contractors won't take on a, what they consider a small job of grab bars not recognizing how important grab bars actually are. Like I would love to start a second business and pair up with a carpenter. He and I, or she and I could be completely booked 24 seven with home improvement projects that nobody else wants to do because they're not considered money makers and they don't take very long, but no, but they make people independent and that's the important part. I just a short plug for Northampton neighbors. When we get back to doing in-person services is we have had a couple of excellent carpenters who, um, are willing to do, are, are most likely are willing to do. We always ask if someone needs the help, if they request it, and we try to help them if we can. Excellent. So we could be a resource, but don't everyone call us at once. <laughs> um, if you have a plastic or one of those tub enclosures, how mm -hmm. do you put a grab bar in without cracking the tub? Ah, good question. I have people ask about that and how to do it without cracking tile. Those are the two things that people will tell me. Um, 
So if you poll my colleagues, I work with seven other OTs, they will tell half and half, half will tell you they like suction cup grab bars. The other half will tell you absolutely no way. Um, to me, suction cup grab bars have come a significantly long way in the last couple of years. So if you have a plastic enclosure, uh, the hard part is we don't know what's behind there. So uh, you need to be able to find a stud to be able to screw that grab bar into. So again, a contractor would be able to tell you if there's a stud in the wall. Sometimes the hard part is um, that there's too much space between the wall and the shower enclosure so that the screws aren't long enough to go through. So the pictures that I showed you where those shower stall, um, the grab bar was also the shampoo holder and things. Those are my mom's condo. She just moved into a condo two years ago in Belchertown. And so she made those requests ahead of time. So they reinforced the wall from the other side before even putting the wall up. So um, if there's a stud, it, you the contractor has a special drill bit that can drill through tile. So it can be done. And if the shower enclosure is thin enough and the wall is right there and there, again, there's a stud, it can be drilled through. If that's not the case though, because of um, that it's a one piece fabrication, there's nothing behind it, then a suction cup grab bar is a very good choice. I would get a kind, make sure that you get the kind that has an indicator. So when you push it against the wall, there's a locking mechanism. There's a little tab on the side that turns green to let you know that the suction is good. When it breaks the seal, it turns red. So it's kind of like a stoplight. Green means go, you're good to go. Red means nope, you need to resecure it. Um, so as long as you keep your shower enclosure clean, um, oftentimes people say, oh, well, I put it up and then it falls down, you know, the next day. And it's just because the, um, there could be film on your shower enclosure that it's not creating a good seal. It could just be the texture of the shower enclosure. It might feel smooth, but really it's not enough to create that suction. So just check the suction each time you try before you get in the shower is always the recommendation. Take them off, resuction them and start again. Um, if you buy supposedly a non-slip kitchen rug, so it has, yeah, it's a non-slip set of plastic kitchen rug, and it still does move around or it can lift up, do you suggest doing the double-sided tape or is there is there any real non-slip rug? So one specifically for the kitchen is what I'm hearing. Kitchen, kitchen or bath, one, but a, a rug that's more plastic that will help you for spills. Um, I haven't had very much interaction with the plastic ones just because I find that they do slip. There's not really any that have a good rubber backing to them. So, and I'm a, a big fan of trying to not use anything on the floor if it doesn't need to be there. So if what you could try, what I've had, had people do who just insist that they do not want to get rid of their rugs and they're going to keep them there no matter what, you can buy a roll of rubber shelf liner. It's about a foot wide and it comes six feet long. It's available at the dollar store. I have probably 10 rolls in the back of my car um, and cut it to size and put that on or a little smaller than what you're, um, what you're putting it underneath. And you can put that underneath and put your plastic mat on top of that. So that's sticky enough that when you put pressure on it, it's not gonna slide. Okay. And, and the bed rails that you showed or the bed supports, yeah. If, if you tend to have a problem with dizziness when you sit up in bed in the middle of the night to then get up, are they strong enough under the mattress to support your weight if you're trying to stand and wobble? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they go far enough underneath. Now, one of the things that I didn't talk about is they also come with a strap. So you can actually anchor that uh, bed rail to the either the box spring underneath or to the bed frame itself. Um, which will then even give it more stability. But because you're pulling on it, you're actually pulling it towards the mattress um, versus pushing it away. And pushing it away would be what would cause it to pull out from the mattress a little bit. But because you're using it for leverage, it stays, it anchors itself very well. Okay, we have two comments, one from Sarah Lennox. Hmm, I'm not sure about what that is. Sarah, if you wanna unmute yourself and let us know. And another comment while she unmutes from Joanna. Johanna is, I love the rubber mat under a throw rug. 
<laughs> it can make a big difference. I have some people who unfortunately just don't have the funds to buy a rubber backed mat for outside of their shower. They just can't do it. And so I'll go out to the car, cut a piece of the shelf liner from my, the back of my car, put it down and either use the rug that they already have to then create that non-slip surface, or we put, they put their towel down if they insist on using a towel instead. So there's lots of options for that rubber back shelf liner stuff. And it's, they make something in my profession called Dyson, which is super sticky. Um, and it's often used for people whose plate might get away from them, or I put it under people's wheelchair cushions so that they don't slide out of their chair. Sometimes people mm. will go to scoot forward and the cushion goes with them. So you can put a piece up under there. There's lots of uses for it, but, um, I like the dollar version as opposed to a roll of Dyson that goes for about a hundred dollars. So <laughs> that makes sense. Cheap and cheerful on my end of the world. Okay. Sarah Lennox says, uh, Sarah Lennox says that was a message from the cat who walked on the keyboard saying how much she likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Sarah. We've been getting furry friend recommend uh, support. So tell the cat, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. If we have any final questions, raise your hand or unmute yourself. If you're on speaker view, your picture will show up. Otherwise, I want to make one more plea for Northampton neighbors, but I really want to thank Jennifer for giving a wonderful, wonderful talk. I think it's helpful. I have my notes on what I'm going to go out and buy or search the internet for, because in my view, I want to prevent it before anything happens, and this, that will help, I hope. Um, so thank you. And we can't clap, but we can do whatever. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody for attending. Northampton Neighbors, as you know, is a nonprofit or maybe you don't know is nonprofit. We rely on writing grants and donations. So if you love this talk, if you love anything, if you love Northampton Neighbors, please go to northamptonneighbors.org and give us a donation if you're able. But it's been a pleasure and thank you very much everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, it was my pleasure. <laughs>